皆さんおはようございます。Good morning, everyone. これからキーノートを楽しむための設定の説明をしていきます。English follows Japanese。Zoom での参加者に連絡です。キーノートに入る前に、Zoom の操作について2つ連絡します。1つは通訳の設定で、もう1つは Q&A の練習です。I'm explaining two points from now to Zoom attendees. One is interpretation setting and the other Q&A. 通訳の設定はスライドにあるように2ステップです。まず、Zoom の画面の下から通訳アイコンをクリックしてください。そして次に聞きたい言語をクリックしてください。日本語を選ぶと日本語に翻訳された音声が聞こえます。First, I'm explaining an interpretation setting.You have two steps to join interpretation line.First, see the bottom of the Zoom screen and click on the interpretation icon.And click the language that you would like to hear. Choosing English, you can hear the English audio. Speaker Richie san, please set up your interpretation too. Dewa, tsugi ni sumimas. Kondo wa zoom no gamen shita no. Q&A のアイコンをクリックしてください。質問を書き込めます。質疑の時間では、集まった中から私が選んで、リッチさんに回答していただきます。Now, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen.You can write in your questions at any time.In the questions and answers session, I will pick from the gathered. And Mr. Rich will answer them. では、Q&A の練習です。通訳の設定がうまくいっていない方は、通訳の説明をお願いしますと書いてください。それ以外の方は、こんにちはなど、好きな言葉を書いてください。Let's try.Write hello or any other words you like.Otherwise, you have trouble in your interpretation setting. Please write, explain the interpretation again. Minasan, arigato gozaimasu. Thank you, everyone. Shitsmon wa nihongo demo daijoubu desu. Questions are also okay in Japanese and in English. 皆さんありがとうございます。Q&A に、えー、通訳についての質問はないようなので先に進みます。次お願いします。はい、では続いてスピーカーのリッチさんを紹介していきます。リッチさんはガンドットアイオーの共同設立者です。ガンドットアイオーはグローバルなコンサルティングファームでフリーソフトウェアやオープンソースソフトウェアのコミュニティから来た最も優秀なエンジニア、ハッカーたちが所属しています。彼は Python における主要なサーバレスフレームワーク、ザッパの作者です。ザッパは何千もの企業やユーザーによって使われ、Web デプロイにおける時間と費用を節約しています。彼は医療や科学計算向けのクラウド GPU クラスターから、モバイルのピアツーピアのファイル共有アプリまで、そしてその間にあるあらゆるものに取り組んできました。彼の趣味は
、スケートボード、サザンヒップホップとラフロイグを飲むことです。I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mr. Rich. Rich is the co founder of Gun.io, a global consulting firm staffed by the best hackers from the free and open source software community. He is the author of Zappa, the leading serverless Python framework used by thousands of companies and users. To save time and money for their web deployments. He has worked on everything from cloud GPU clusters for medical and scientific computing to mobile peer to peer file sharing applications and on everything in between. In his spare time, he enjoys skateboarding, dirty southern trap music, and rough road. キーノートのハッシュタグは、パイコン JP です。感想や気づきなど、ぜひハッシュタグをつけてツイートしてみてください。The hashtag for the keynote is p y c o n j p p l e a s e feel free to tweet your thoughts and observations with the hashtag. それでは、リッチさんのキーノートを始めます。Now, we are going to start Mr. Rich's keynote. 発表時間は質疑を含んで60分です。The presentation time is 60 minutes, including questions and answers. 発表前にマイクテストを兼ねて、スピーカーに読み上げ事項を読み上げていただきます。Before the presentation, the speaker will read the paper for a microphone test. So, Richie, please read the paper now. Okay.、Um, I have to move some screens around.、Um, my name is Rich Jones. The title of my presentation is From Serverless to Stateless.、Uh, my presentation will be in English. My presentation materials are in English and they are free and open source. Um, I will publish them. They are already on my GitHub.、Uh, I agree to have my picture taken during this presentation and I agree to comply with the PyCon JP code of conduct. Thank you. So, let's go to the comment. Richie, please share your screen. Sorry, one second while I figure.、Oh, thank you. I can you are screen. I need to go into. I'm sorry about this. I need to go into minimal mode so I can sure. see. Oh no, where did it go?、Ah. Oh no, there's a button, I lost it. I'm sorry about this. How's everybody doing?、Ah, I'm so sorry.、Uh, yes,、uh, to, I can see your screen,、uh, maybe browser window. So I can see your slide and address bar and tab. Uh, and uh, your voice is clear. Okay,、uh, let's, get, let's get it rolling then. I can't figure out the.、Uh, there used to be a minimize or like, ooh, not that. Minimal window. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let it rock. Okay, hi guys. Thank you for having me.、Um, uh, it's, a, it's a super honor and a privilege、uh, to be speaking at PyCon JP for you guys today.、Um, I met Nikki 
and um, the rest of the the team last year. And I'm I'm so happy that they uh, 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 invited me to speak to you guys today. Um, my name is Rich Jones. Um, I am the author of Zappa, which is Python's serverless framework. Um, I've also written a whole bunch of other projects that are free and open source, including NoDB, Lambda packages, um, some Django packages that you might have used, some uh, tools like Loop and Soundscrape and OmniHash, and a whole bunch more you can find on my GitHub. And welcome to my talk, which is from serverless to stateless. Um, first, a disclaimer. Um, this will be a little bit different from my usual talks if anybody has seen me uh, speak before, um, because I, like many of you, have been trapped in my house because of this horrible plague for the past six months. And it's, it's made me lose a little bit of my mind, <laughs> but I'm gonna try to keep it together for you guys and share some of uh, what I've been up to, what I've been thinking about uh, during these crazy times. Yeah, um, and these are crazy times. Uh, so uh, this talk is gonna be a little bit less about how to solve problems and the technical things that we do to solve those problems and more about how we should be thinking about what problems are we actually trying to solve. Um, and most importantly, the thing that I wanna uh, drive home for everybody today is that I think that we need to solve them together. That's very important. Uh, this talk is gonna move pretty fast, um, but I kind of have the belief that it's better to be overwhelmed with information than to be bored during a talk. So I'm just gonna try not to bore you. If there's too much information, you can go back on YouTube and watch it uh, again then. Uh, I also wanna say thank you to the amazing translation team that PyCon JP has put together for this. Uh, let's get some hachi, 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 pachi, 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 pachi in the chat going for these guys. They're working so hard. Everybody at the conference is doing so well. I'm seeing behind the scenes. They've got a really excellent operation. They're doing such a good job with this. Uh, you know, it's they're putting together a virtual conference during an emergency times is an amazing feat. And I think it's an amazing co accomplishment that they've done. So everybody gets a hachi, hachi, hachi. Um, let's get going. Okay, going serverless with Zappa. Um, my story so far, or how I came uh, to the problem. Uh, yeah, like many of you, I had the problem of I needed a website. Uh, I had been traveling around the world. I haven't made it to Japan yet. I very much intend to. And I was taking these um, kind of like photosphere pictures everywhere. And I, I just needed a place to put them online. But I faced the problem that uh, website hosting was very expensive. Uh, I knew the old technique of using virtual private servers, VPS, and I already had a couple of other projects going, uh, and they needed I needed four different servers, and it was each of them was costing me twenty dollars a month. And I did the math, you know, you can add it up, uh, and I'm paying a thousand dollars a year just to keep some of my uh, my projects online. And I, you know, I don't, I, I'm kind of a cyber bum person. I don't, you know, how I wanted to, to lower that cost. And uh, as one of my recent jobs, I got to use this technology called Lambda that I really liked. And then AWS came out with a new technology called um, uh, API Gateway. Uh, so I thought, uh, you know, and there was this, this buzzword going around that a lot of people on Hacker News we're talking about called serverless. Uh, so I was thinking, can I run my website without permanent servers, you know, without having to maintain all of this infrastructure and pay all that cost. So that kind of put the, the spark in my head and I had the, the idea for Zappa. Um, so the model for a traditional web server, um, the, old, the old kind that I was paying a lot of money for, uh, you're probably all familiar with, um, there's a web server like Apache or Nginx, which is listening for an incoming request. Uh, that then gets converted into the whiskey environment, environment, which all of the Python web frameworks speak. Uh, the whiskey server sends that to your web application framework like Django, who processes the request and it returns it back through the web server so it can listen for the next one. But with Zappa, 
uh, a request comes in through API Gateway, the API request gets mapped using a, an esoteric language called VTL. Uh, at that point, the web server is created. Uh, Zappa converts that into a dictionary, uh, uh, which is compatible with Whiskey, feeds it into the package Django application and returns it back through the API gateway, at which point the server disappears and the API gateway returns your response to the client. And it does all of that in about 30 milliseconds. Uh, so by the time that the user is actually uh, seeing the page on their screen, the server is no longer spinning. Um, and this comes with a whole bunch of interesting advantages. Uh, the first one is the scalability. So because each server, Map, uh, each request maps to, uh, you know, one request maps to one server, 10 requests maps to 10 servers and 100 to 100 and 1,000 to 1,000, and you can just keep going. Uh, it's also orders of magnitude less expensive, particularly for low, medium traffic uh, websites, like a personal website. Uh, you're only paying by the millisecond. So I was, you know, you're paying 0 0.000000002 milliseconds per second. Uh, which I converted, it's 0 0.000000002 yen per millisecond. Um, and you get 3 million seconds a year for free, I believe. Um, so uh, it costs about 75 cents to run a server for, for, uh, for a month, minus those free seconds, as I ended up uh, paying $0 a year to host my websites. So I went from paying $1,000 a year to paying nothing. Um, there's also zero maintenance. I, uh, I, I like building. I don't like maintaining very much. Uh, there's no load balancing to worry about, uh, no security patches, no uh, you know, kernel patches to apply and keep all the software updated. There's no downtime because if it's not actively supplying the, re the request, it already is down. Uh, and what else can you do with it, you ask? You can also build these things called event-driven architectures, which are very fun, uh, which means that you can execute your Python functions in response to events which happen inside of your uh, application's ecosystem. So that might thing be things like a file upload. So maybe you want to make um, an avatar if you're building a community website or something like that. So people upload a picture, you process it, and store it in a bucket. You don't need a queue or anything like that. It can work for files. It can work for emails. It can work for database events like new users. Okay, you are a needy person and you want even more features than that. That's great. We've got you covered. You can do rollbacks. Go back. If something breaks, you can type in Zappa rollback and go back to a working version. You want free SSL certificates? We've got you with uh, um, uh, just type in Zappa certify and it'll uh, give you a free SSL certificate gives you log auditing with Zappa tail. Uh, it will keep the servers fast by automatically calling them from time to time. Uh, it works with quite a lot of C extensions, so NumPy and stuff like that. Uh, all of, yeah, all of these things uh, work out of the box. Uh, you can load your environment variables if you have different stages. Um, you just put in a little config string upload that to your S3 bucket, tell Zappa where to look, and then call it as if it was a defined environment variable inside of your application. Uh, it integrates very nicely with continuous integration and continuous delivery systems uh, by uh, supplying JSON output for all of the commands. Uh, you can execute code directly as, as well. So if your application is deployed and you want to just call a function, just type Zappa invoke uh, your function uh, with a with a Pythonic namespace, and that will then execute in your Zappa environment in the cloud. Um, you can also just execute Python code directly if you want to see what will happen uh, inside of your application, or if you need to run a hotfix or something like that. You can use TechTech -tech Raw and simply execute uh, your Python code directly. Uh, it integrates perfectly with Django uh, by using the manage prefix. You can just execute any Django management command. Uh, and the best of all, you don't need to modify any of your existing web applications because uh, the, the wizards uh, who came up with the whiskey uh, did it in such a smart way and everybody used whiskey. 
uh, you don't need to modify any of your existing applications. Uh, it's pretty well battle tested at this point. Um, the community and the maintainers who are better than I am are doing a great job of working out most of the, the bugs and stuff. So it is now used in production by banks, governments, and medical companies uh, around the world, uh, as well as many uh, other people. Um, and yeah, it works with any whiskey application without any modification. It works with Django, it works with Wagtail, it works with Pinax, a lot of great stuff out there. It works with Flask, works with Pyramid, works with Bottle, works with Hub. This guy used it and he saved a bunch of money in five minutes. So, uh, and he didn't even have to do anything. So, you know, shout out that guy. You could be like that guy. Okay, I've sold you, you're convinced. Zappa sounds awesome. How do you get started? It's very, very easy. Pip install Zappa. Zappa init, hit yes. It'll load, it'll generate the configuration for you automatically. Zappa deploy, it'll do all this stuff. You don't even need to know what this stuff does, but it does it behind the hood. Um, and then your website is online. It's that easy. So in like three commands, you can have a fully functional, uh, serverless, scalable uh, web application ready to go. And at that point, you're pretty much uh, production ready for, for a lot of tasks. Um, you can also build uh, event-driven architectures, uh, which I find particularly fun and enjoyable. Uh, uh, there's no blocking pages. You don't have to use Celery. I'm not trying to insult the creators of Celery, uh, but I have never had a, a lot of fun uh, setting the queuing system for Celery up. Um, but what if you don't want to wait for an event? Zappa can also execute functions asynchronously in different lambdas simultaneously. So as an example, uh, let's bake a cake. So this is our bake a cake function. Uh, this is, I don't do a whole lot of baking, uh, but this is how I imagine a cake is made. You gather the ingredients, you give it a recipe uh, and call a bake function, and then you deliver it to the person who wants to eat delicious cake. Uh, if you wanna do this asynchronously, you can import Zappa, asynchronous uh, import task, and then give it a decorator to your bake a cake function. Uh, and now when you call the order cake method, suppose this is a flask application, something like that, this uh, bake a cake will now execute in an entirely different Lambda. Uh, it's, it's that easy. So rather than building a complex, uh, uh, configuration or queue or celery based system, uh, you, we wrote like four lines of code and it'll just work out of the box and it'll scale all the way up. Uh, so yeah, you could really go, uh, go nuts with this and build, uh, uh, you know, tons of, tons of fun stuff. Uh, but what if we want more cake? What if, what if I, you know, I'm American and I need a lot of cake. Uh, what if we need to bake mission critical cakes for the entire planet. Uh, and that's where we can do something else that's very interesting uh, called globally available serverless architectures, uh, which sounds cool, but why do you need that? Um, because if your servers are nowhere, because we uh, have no permanent infrastructure, then the servers can be everywhere. Um, so this gives us a lot of benefits when we are using global deployments. Uh, the primary one is redundancy um, because cloud computing is an act of faith. Uh, Amazon does go down, you know, uh, the cloud isn't magical. The cloud is just somebody else's computers. You know, they're just managing it for you and uh, they're engineers just like us and they make mistakes or their systems get overloaded and they go down too. Um, this happened uh, in the United States. It happens somewhat commonly all around the world and who can blame them? Uh, but when uh, it does happen, it usually only happens in a single region. So maybe it'll happen in Japan, maybe it'll happen in the United States, but it's not gonna happen in both at the same time. Um, okay, pro tip, little aside. Uh, don't host your status pages on the same infrastructure as the systems uh, 
you know, your production systems. Uh, Amazon did this. And although Amazon wasn't working at the time, they were still hosting this symbol on the same infrastructure. So uh, it said, actually it was a, the green thumbs up, the green check mark rather than the red symbol. So it still reported that everything was fine because this, uh, the, the error symbol was not being reported properly. Uh, yeah, so here you can see everything looks like it's fine, but really it's not because the thing that's showing the symbol is, is wrong, which was a, a pretty funny fail. Uh, I like to see Amazon fail as we'll see in a little bit. Uh, the second advantage is speed. So here's me paying from uh, uh, my house in Philadelphia to Ohio, which I bet uh, none of you know where Ohio is. I bet most Americans probably don't know where Ohio is, but that's where one of the Amazon uh, uh, data centers are. And you can see that it took uh, 40 milliseconds from, uh, from my house to Ohio. But then if I ping Tokyo from my house, it takes 200 milliseconds. Uh, and that's just for the round trip. That's not for the, the server processing, you know, any, whatever your application is doing. And that's uh, kind of a long time that to a user uh, of your web application that feels uh, slow. And we don't wanna be slow for everybody in the world. We wanna be fast for everybody. Uh, there's nothing we can really do about that. It's just a function of the fact that Earth is a very big place. Although it feels like it's getting smaller, it's still pretty big as far as uh, light and speed are concerned. So this gives you a way to provide all of the world's users with equally great service because your application is deployed to all of those places in the same way. Uh, okay, I think I probably convinced you that uh, globally available architectures are a good idea. How do we do it? Okay, we remember Zappa init. Uh, during that little question box that it gives you at the beginning when you're setting it up, it'll ask you, do you wanna make this a global application? You just say yes. And then you will uh, get a configuration file which contains uh, endpoints and configurations for all of the available regions that you choose. Uh, and then when you deploy, you use tac tac all uh, if you generate uh, security certificates, tech tech all again, and that's it. You're now, your application is now operating serverlessly, scalable, fast to everybody in the world. Uh, and then we do the ping, yeah, and everything works. So good. Okay, so that was kind of my story of, of getting Zappa set up, but then I just wanted to make a website. You know, like uh, I've gone way off the path and the thing that I really want to do kind of with my life is promote freedom for, for computer users and application users. But instead of promoting freedom, I've now just convinced a lot of people, uh, oh yeah, I just wanted a super easy and cheap way to, to host my, my website. But now I've convinced a lot of people around the world to use Amazon. And uh, that, that, I don't love that. I don't work for Amazon. Um, so now we come to the next chapter of the story, which is why you should forget everything that I just told you and not use Zappa. Um, Amazon as a corporation has been very hostile to the free and open source software community. Um, whereas once they were a neutral platform, uh, now they are a competitor. Uh, every time that a uh, new database project or uh, architecture server projects comes up, they make a tweak, they make a proprietary version and they sell it. Um, and because of that practice of taking the work that we do for free and then uh, you know, taking over uh, in the past few uh, months and years, We've lost MongoDB and Redis and the wonderful Elasticsearch uh, all became proprietary licenses. Whereas once these were free software, because of Amazon's practices, they are no longer uh, free software. And I think this is, a, this is very dangerous. This is bad. This is bad for our community. This is bad for our users. Uh, this is bad for 
uh, everybody. This is a bad thing. So I don't like that either. And uh, Zappa had this problem too. They, they, they took Zappa as far as I'm concerned. They modified it to make it uh, less usable and less free. And uh, yeah, they cloned the project. They, they removed its ability to uh, leave Amazon. And they never contacted me or gave me a link or credit or they didn't even give me a t-shirt, you know? Uh, they just took the work and, and, and uh, made their own version of it, which if anybody else uh, like me is, is getting a little bit older, you might remember uh, Microsoft using the expression embrace, extend, extinguish back in the 1990s. Um, when Microsoft was very afraid of the popularity of Linux taking over from uh, Windows domination of the desktop market, um, they used this technique to, to crush it by uh, uh, taking free standards, uh, embracing them and changing them and then killing the free version. And it feels very similar to that. Um, so we should remember our history and uh, not accept this. Um, and that's just for the Amazon web services. So Amazon as a corporation does not pay taxes uh, somehow in the United States. So here we can see in blue, this is the amount of profit that Amazon as a corporation is making. And it has only increased since 2018 when uh, this graph was made. But you can see that they pays, they've only paid zero taxes. And now in fact, they're getting negative taxes. So for some reason, uh, at least in the United States, the government is giving them money to, to do this. Uh, the effect has been very devastating to uh, America. Ordinary people who simply own shops and things like that are uh, having to close their businesses down because they can't compete with Amazon because they do pay taxes. Um, they also are very hostile to their workers. Um, Jeff Bezos makes enough money in two to six hours to pay for the benefits cut that he had for his uh, Whole Foods employees, which is a, a food shop in America. Uh, you know, in two hours he could pay for their for the medical coverage because we don't have um, health coverage uh, in the United States. We re rely on our employers, and, and Jeff Bezos refused to pay two hours of his money to pay for his employees' health care. Um, they also overwork and underpay their employees. There are stories of Amazon workers in their factories who are not allowed to go to the toilet during their shift. It's just humiliating, undignified work. They're very hostile towards unions. Uh, and Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, is literally the richest man in the world. Uh, just this week, he passed the $2 billion, uh, uh, sorry, $200 billion uh, personal wealth amount, which I believe is something like, uh, that's gonna be uh, like, it's unimaginable, unimaginable amounts of wealth. The human brain cannot comprehend that amount of money. Um, even just during the pandemic time, because everybody is trapped inside of their houses here because of uh, COVID-19, he's increased his personal wealth by this is this says seventy billion dollars. Um, it's now ninety billion dollars just in the past few months. Um, he's literally the bad guy from movies. Uh, he's a he's a James Bond bad guy. Uh, this is a picture of Jeff Bezos in some kind of gigantic robot mecha suit. Uh, I believe this is part of his plan to destroy us all. I imagine that he will be riding around in a giant robot while we all work for him. Uh, yeah, screw him. I don't like that guy. I don't like Amazon. I don't like Jeff Bezos. Uh, I hope they're not a sponsor. I checked. I don't think they are. So I think we're good there. I'm sorry if they are. I didn't mean to get you guys in trouble. Um, okay, the fun part. Let's build our own version of AWS Lambda. And we're gonna do it using some technology called OpenFast. Uh, OpenFast is a great project. It's got a great team behind it. Uh, so you guys rem might remember the old term LAMP for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and Python. Uh, we're not going to do, do LAMP anymore. We're doing PLONK, okay? And PLONK uh, stands for Prometheus, Linkerd, OpenFast, 
Nats and Kubernetes, uh, some of which you might have heard of, some of which you might have not. And the ones that we're really concerned about are OpenFast and Kubernetes. Um, this is a, what they do. You don't really need to know too much about that. Um, but by combining those different free technologies, we are able to create our own alternative to AWS Lambda and API Gateway. Um, you can run this on any cloud host, doesn't have to be Amazon, can be Microsoft, can be Google, whoever, don't like them too much either, but uh, if that's who you're going with, you have the choice now and that's good. Or you can run it on your own hardware, or you can run it in a way so you have some of your own hardware and you have some of Microsoft and some of Amazon and you can build these multi-cloud applications, uh, which gives you additional redundancy and cost benefit. Um, okay, so let's try it out. And the way I, I encourage you to try it out is with a new project that I've been working on a little bit called Fashion, um, which is easy and awesome Pythonic OpenFast. So I'm trying to do for OpenFast what Zappa did for Lambda using Fashion. Uh, it's on my GitHub, you can check it out. I need help. Um, it has a lot of capabilities that Amazon and Lambda did not provide for us. Um, for instance, we can use OpenFast functions as if they were, ooh, I have a staff. There's a, somebody raised their hand. I have to look at it, I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that. Oop. Apologies for the interruption. I don't know how to do this. Raise up. Hi.一旦先に進んでいただいて大丈夫です。スタッフの方でも対応をします。Can I keep going, Nikki? All right. I'm sorry, are we still good? Nikki, help. <laughs> I'm gonna keep going. I saw that the staff raised their hand, but I don't know how to look at that. So until somebody tells me not to, I'm gonna keep going. Sorry. Um, we can use open fast functions uh, as if they were just regular Python functions inside of our program. Um, but in fact, they run inside of isolated containers inside of our Kubernetes um, architecture, uh, which enables us to do some really awesome things uh, that, that feel kind of magical. So if you have a function called figlet that you've uh, that you've written, then when you write a program that looks like this, so a little two-line program, uh, when you call your figlet function, which turns uh, uh, text strings into you know big ASCII things like this, uh, this figlet function is actually running inside of a separate isolated container, even though in our program it looks like it's just any other Python function that we would call. Uh, you don't need to do any uh, special thing to get this set up uh, because of a Python extension uh, proposal number 562, which is already available in Python 3, um, which was a, a excellent invention. Whoever is responsible for that, it's very helpful. Uh, we can also chain functions together. So if I have a function called left pad and a function called figlet, I can left pad my figlet function or figlet my left pad function uh, and get the result as if it were uh, a native Python, uh, you know, just a, a normal program. But in fact, both of these functions are executing on different containers inside of our architecture. So they might actually be executing on completely different physical computers, but our program looks like it's just running locally on our laptop. Uh, we can make these calls asynchronously by appending the word async to any function that we want to execute, uh, which enables us to build 
uh, complex transformation pipelines uh, without having to set up any queues or uh, any complicated configurations like that. Um, just tell the functions to call each other and they will. Um, and we can also limit that function execution to different uh, types of computer. Uh, this is my favorite part. This is what I've been uh, very excited about. I think there's a lot of opportunities for experimentation and development in this area, a lot of potential uh, to do interesting things. Um, the, the key is that uh, we can run the hard problem, like maybe your artificial intelligence model, uh, uh, you know, some statistical thing, some, something expensive on the expensive hardware that needs all of that, uh, you know, whatever big thing that uh, it needs. And then do the easy part, the easy part, the easy problems on the cheaper hardware. Um, so to do this, uh, we define a function definition. So say we have a function update model, we tell it uh, to only run this on a GPU. So a computer that has uh, an expensive dedicated graphics processing unit that's used for artificial intelligence a lot. And then we can write a program like this. So a very simple program. Let's supp suppose that we want to update our artificial intelligence model, and then we want to send an email uh, to tell the user that the model has been updated. Um, so we want update model to use the hardware that has the graphics processing unit on it, but we don't need the graphics processing unit to send an email. We could run that on something cheap and leave the graphics processing unit available to do uh, more expensive things. Uh, and this is it. This is the whole program. Uh, Plunk handles the uh, placement of those uh, different functions inside of their containers uh, automatically and will handle the scalability as it needs to. So uh, I find this quite Pythonic and that it's a very short program that is actually doing something quite uh, complicated and powerful behind the scenes. Um, and the benefit of this is automatic cost optimization uh, at the application level, level. So we don't need to, uh, to build complicated pipelines that, uh, and other programs to manage the, uh, the use of resources. It all just sort of happens magically, which is cool. Okay, but again, uh, is this useful? I hope so. I think there's potential in these ideas. Um, I'm not really sure, These, this is experimental. I think it's exciting. I would like other people to uh, kind of start thinking about uh, these problems with me. Uh, I'd like uh, more help and uh, use and ideas from, from everybody. Uh, I hope it's useful. Uh, but again, is this the right problem to solve if we're trying to promote uh, freedom for our users? Uh, I think it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't solve the Amazon problem in that if Amazon wanted to, they'd be able, you know, if, if this became good, they would take our ideas and then they would sell them and not give anything back to our community again. Um, which brings me to the third part of my talk um, from serverless to stateless. Uh, and this is kind of what I really want to talk about in these crazy times. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit philosophical political a little bit. I hope that's okay with everybody now that we've done the technical stuff, but uh, I wanna feed your brain some, uh, some food. Um, uh, I'm calling this Vulcan anarchism. I don't have a better term than that, but I think it kind of encapsulates what I'm, uh, I'm trying to promote here, which is a uh, uh, distributed scientific, uh, but stateless, corporateless uh, approach to problem solving because the world is like really going crazy right now. Uh, if 2020 is any indication, the next few decades, the next few years, the next century is not going to be easy for everybody. Um, we have a, a, a saying in English, which is a curse, which says, may you live in interesting times. Um, and uh, it's, it's supposed to be kind of a warning 
And uh, I think these are interesting times. You know, that's why I'm not able to, to be here with you uh, right now is because we're in interesting times. We're having uh, all, of these, uh, all of these problems. And um, these are new problems. These, the types of problems that we're having now are specific to the 21st century. Um, I think COVID-19 is kind of an early warning test and we failed. Um, you guys did better than us. Uh, we did particularly bad, but I'm thinking from a global perspective, and I think that we didn't do a good job, and uh, we're all paying the price dearly, and it doesn't seem like it's going to get better anytime soon. And in the next few years, uh, we're going to have to deal with a lot more. We're going to have to deal with uh, pandemic viruses like this one and whatever ones come after it. Natural disasters are a growing challenge, as uh, many of you are unfortunately very aware of. We're having similar problems uh, here in the United States with fires and hurricanes, droughts, things like that, as are the rest of the world. Um, the collapse of decaying infrastructure, massive human resettlement as uh, we lose land to climate change and other disasters, shortages of food, technological authoritarianism as both corporations and uh, unfriendly states use technology to uh, increase their power at the cost of the power of ordinary people. Uh, the decline of democratic power. I assume the world has been watching the United States and the collapse of democracy here I think you should take this as a warning of things to come in your own country. Biological catastrophe as uh, the biological engineering revolution begins to occur. And of course, uh, the big one in, in, in my mind, which is the, the disasters which are gonna come as a result of the change of Earth's climate as a result of human activity. The thing that's different about these problems compared to problems of the 20th century is these are transnational problems. So these are problems which affect everybody on earth equally. It's not a national problem or a regional problem anymore. This is something that everybody on earth is having to deal with and we don't have a solution for in the 21st century. The nation state system is not working to solve transnational problems. They're trying, but it's not working. Uh, the corporate system, the market system is not working uh, for transnational problems. They, they just become externalities. So it's my belief that we have to solve these problems ourselves, but we have to do it together. Um, so yeah, the 21st century was defined by national problems and national solutions. So far, the model of the 20th century has been transnational problems, but national solutions. I say no. And here's the exciting part. My thesis is that because transnational problems need transnational solutions, the free software community can be a model for organizing solutions to those problems. Um, free software, Python, open source, all of us, we have an excellent history of international collaboration. I don't know of any organization in the, in the world that has done a, a better job than the leaderless system of uh, free software development. You know, Zappa alone has contributors from six continents, uh, you know, hundreds of people coming together and, and working on this stuff with no, nobody told them to do that. It was just uh, an impulse to, to collaborate internationally. Um, so these are some of the big ones that we've been, that have been working on uh, over the past uh, many decades now. Uh, of course, there are others, but these are the, the big ones in my mind. 1985 GNU, 1989 Python, we all, we all know it and love it. Uh, Linux, Wikipedia, OpenStreetMaps, but that was in 2004. What's going on? That's a long time ago. What happened? Why have there been no new massive international collaborative efforts uh, really since uh, OpenStreetMaps. Uh, have we given up? Did we just decide that we weren't gonna solve problems in that way anymore? It doesn't feel like that. 
Um, everybody I know in open source is working really hard on their projects. We're, we're, we're all busy all the time. People are pr producing excellent software. Um, but I think we've forgotten about the types of problems that we want to solve. Um, instead of providing non-state, non-corporate, liberation-focused projects, um, a lot of our work is just to provide free work to the world's richest corporations. Um, you know, by producing these little, these libraries and interfaces and things like that, that then just get used up by gigantic uh, capital funded technology corporations rather than trying to increase the amount of uh, human liberation and participation. So uh, I was reading a book, and it's not a book about software, um, called Bullshit Jobs. Uh, by uh, a guy called David Graeber, who uh, uh, I'm a pretty big fan of. And I just happened to come across, uh, come across this quote about open source software in the book. And it says, nowadays, companies rely heavily on open source software and employ software developers to apply duct tape. I assume, I hope that that's translated properly. I couldn't find a direct translation for duct tape to the technology that they get for free. Um, and that's the job of a lot of software to developers today is to take open software, open source software and to make it fit together. Um, are we here to supply free work for Jeff Bezos? Is that why we have these amazing international conferences and why we work so hard on our open source projects? Of course not, no. Um, and which brings us to another 21st century problem, which is a lack of purpose in life. I think. Uh, uh, a lot of the, the men that I know, a lot of the women that I know as well, um, struggle with this, you know, um, they are unable to find uh, meaningful work. Um, and in the book, uh, it, it did a survey and found that in many advanced uh, economies, almost half of the jobs that are out there are bullshit. And he's using this definition of bullshit in the book. Um, which I, I mostly agree with, which is uh, paid employment that is so pointless, even the employee cannot justify its existence outside of getting their paycheck. And I know so many people in jobs like this uh, that are mainly there to provide, to make their bosses look good, but provide no actual value to the world. And in fact, there are entire industries which are devoted for this, that are sucking up some of the greatest minds uh, uh, that, that are out there right now, well-educated people. You know, why are all these, uh, the smartest people from Stanford and uh, uh, MIT and all the great universities in Japan and around the world, they're working for these advertising corporations that are not really providing uh, value for their communities or for the, the, the people. They're mostly just surveillance advertising. Um, and it, this is happening at a time when we have so many significant problems uh, that we are going to have to solve for the 21st century. Uh, and so many people are working on bullshit and it just breaks my heart. But I think this also provides an opportunity uh, uh, to solve itself, right? Uh, and I think that the free software movement can provide a model for creating meaningful work in people's lives. Um, we should have a thousand projects the size of Wikipedia. We should have a thousand projects that can bring people together the way that, that Python does. Um, the four elements of projects that I think uh, are successful in this approach have strong technical engineering, massive international collaboration, they're focused on human liberation rather than uh, creating profit, and they are most importantly not state endeavors, they're not corporate endeavors, they're just people coming together to do these things. And I think we should deliberately refocus on trying to grow and cultivate projects that contain these elements. Um, as a brief aside, uh, this is a, a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, in uh, America, we use the expression, uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, that didn't translate uh, directly, I think. So I believe that this means uh, the thing that everybody knows that is uncomfortable to talk about. And uh, I'm referring to a guy named RMS, Richard Stallman, um, who is the founder of the free software movement. And the reason why all of the projects that we take for granted ever got started, I think. He's the inventor of the GPL license and the concept of copyleft as opposed to copyright, so making people share. 
Um, he's been uh, for decades the driving force for the global adoption of the free software movement. He's also the author of Emacs, uh, although I personally use Vim, don't tell him that. Um, uh, you might not be aware of, the, of a story that's happening in the United States. Um, there's a guy named Jeffrey Epstein uh, who is involved in a very high level political uh, uh, corruption scandal in the United States. Uh, Richard Stallman made a comment about this uh, on an internal emailing list um, to, to provide context. Uh, people with far more direct and serious connections to Jeffrey Epstein have not been punished. As far as I know, Richard Stallman is the only person who has been punished despite not actually being involved in any way. Um, this comment was misreported. He was taken out of context and misreported uh, in a magazine called Vice, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, who uh, is one of the most evil men on the planet, the owner of Fox News. Um, and because of this and the outrage that that article created, he was removed from his job, um, which was also his home where he lived because he uh, is uh, a nomad and he, he literally just lived in his office at MIT. And as far as I could see, nobody said anything because uh, people are kind of afraid of the, of the culture in the United States right now. And this made me very sad. So I, I feel a little morally obligated to, to say a few a quick few words about Richard Solomon. Um, another elephant in the room here is that Richard Solomon, I don't clearly has um, autism. Uh, he does not understand social situations in the same way that I think um, uh, most people do. This is pretty clear. Uh, uh, it can be very challenging to work with people with uh, autism, high functioning autism or any type of autism, but I think that it is worth the reward of, of uh, keeping uh, doing it, of trying to do it. Um, so please just remember to be kind to the people in our communities who have their brains wired a little bit differently than, than you might and just try to be understanding uh, I'm saying this as an outsider. I don't know the whole story. I've never met uh, RMS and have no connection to him. But to me, he was very similar to Jesus. And I'm, I'm not entirely joking about that. You know, he's, his ideas had a, a big uh, impact on, on the way that I live my life. Uh, I'm not an internal member. I've never met him. I don't know any of the people involved. But uh, I'm somebody who has taken his ideas and I want to promote them. So I just wanna make sure that if that chapter is ending, that we don't forget the missions and the achievements of the free software movement. And I want to keep our focus on the power of people uh, rather than nation states and corporations. Um, okay, so what power do we have? I think most people around the world are finding that uh, political power, democratic power, uh, the power of workers is declining. But we, as an open source community, have a lot of power. Our power has been growing quite significantly. We run the world, quite literally. Python is on almost every computer in the world. You know, most of the world's computers run Linux. Everybody in the world uses Wikipedia at some point. We have significant power and influence because of what we've been able to accomplish by coming together in this way. So let's start thinking about what else can we power? Um, here are some challenges that I've identified that don't have solutions in this way yet. Carbon reduction removal is a big one. Uh, this is a massive engineering the, the issue that's going to take a lot of people. I've been working on a little bit. I'd like to talk about some of the specifics in a, in a different talk in the future and the way that Python can be involved. Natural disaster response has been a failure from state and corporate uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, the production of essential medicines, there's an access to uh, essential medicines movement, uh, who I think we should collaborate with and support. Uh, the management of food and forest land is another one that has uh, engineering problems with no uh, global solution yet. Um, the protection of free communication is one that's very near and dear to our hearts for uh, a lot of hackers uh, in the room who might be out there. I'm particularly excited about a project called ZeroNet, um, a peer-to-peer -peer web uh, system that is written in Python that is showing a lot of potential. Uh, check that out if you can. Care for the elderly, I think is a big one. The, the world's population is becoming older and 
uh, I don't think that either state or corporate uh, solutions, especially in the United States and uh, other Western countries will be satisfactory for what we want for the old people in our lives. And I could go on, you probably have other ideas about things that aren't being fixed in your head. You know, you know that there are challenges and problems that need these types of solutions. Uh, basically, anything that involves the health of the planet and the people who live on uh, Earth to, with us. Um, I think the best types of problems for us in the Python community uh, to work on in this space are the meta problems, which means the problems about the problems. Um, yeah, these are great opportunities for Python community because of the friendly approach, the human centered approach um, that are part of Python's core values uh, ex extend very well to uh, the meta problems for transnational collaboration. Um, one of these issues is transnational decision making. So these are these are going to be some examples of things that I think Python specifically can be useful for creating new types of uh, solutions. So transnational decision making is one of them. Um, this is an unsolved problem. We have democracy in our nations, but we don't have a global democracy yet. We don't have fluid democracy between nations, between different types of people. Uh, what are ways that the people of the United States and the people of, D of Japan can make democratic decisions together? This is something that we're gonna have to figure out for the 21st century. And I think it's something that we as a community uh, can actually be the people to provide a solution for. Uh, I suggest that the Schultz algorithm be useful in this. There are plenty of Python-based Schultz uh, uh, implementations out there. It's a uh, ranked choice democratic voting uh, system. I've built uh, a personal application using it. I think it's great. I think it could be expanded to encompass uh, a lot more people. Translation is another uh, major issue, uh, as I've discovered in this, uh, in this process. In 2020, it's still impossible to have a real-time multi-language conversation with another person. Uh, this technology, oh, although they're doing their best, and I bet this has been very difficult for them. I hope they're able to keep up. I'm sorry, I have, a, I have quite a bit of content and I talk quite quickly. They've been doing their best. They're doing such a good job. Everybody's doing a good job. Hachi, pachi, pachi, hachi, hachi, hachi. Uh, but, you know, for ordinary people, we can't have uh, the wonderful Python Japan translators uh, in every conversation that we wanna have, we, we're gonna have to use technology to solve this problem. And I think the technology does already exist, but we haven't created uh, a liberated free, uh, free for everybody version yet. So I think that's something that we could be working on. The protection of generational knowledge. Uh, recently, the leader of Python retired, Richard Stallman has, has been forced out. Uh, we must be losing a lot of knowledge when generations pass and as our populations get older. Uh, we should be protecting this knowledge and I have an idea that we should be uh, using these people as leadership, uh, you know, and advice on, on international councils. So have some of the, the leaders from the past become international uh, advice givers. Uh, and finally, the creation and management of good jobs. So going back to uh, the, the bullshit jobs issue is, is working on these projects like Python and uh, you know all of the amazing work that all of you guys do, it, it gives meaning and purpose to our lives and makes us feel like we're uh, spending our time on earth well. So let's, let's try to expand this to other fields and more people. Um, and to do that, we're gonna need managers. Uh, and not just, not just the engineers who are creating the things, but the people uh, who help the engineers get what they need to accomplish those tasks and define what they should be doing, how, you know, give them advice on how to do it and things like that. Uh, and to go along with that are the uh, frameworks and tools for managing these types of transnational projects. I think this is a, a totally unsolved problem that we would do a really good job if we tried. Uh, and I think this would create purpose in life for a lot of people if we gave them the opportunity to participate in these communities uh, and, and solutions and engineering challenges in the way that we do. Um, yeah, let's have a, let's have more Linuxes. Let's have more Pythons. Let's have more Wikipedia's. Let's let's try let's go all in on this and try to uh, solve some big problems in the same way that we were able to solve those problems in the past. And I think you 
should be the one to do it. Uh, get a friend, just start building, you know, have an idea and just start making stuff. It's very fun. And the best part is that smart, uh, amazing people who you've never met before will see what you're doing and they'll want to join up. And then uh, as a maintainer, I'm not, I'm not the best maintainer, but uh, what I found is that if you give people responsibilities, if somebody shows up in your community who's eager and wants to try and wants to help, give them something to do, give them a task. And nine times out of 10, they will uh, just amaze you with the things that they come up with. And it's so exciting. And finally, I don't think that we have a choice. I think that this is a responsibility of something we have to do. Uh, we inherited the world and we need to make it better than when we found it. Because there's two futures that I see. One is living on a dead planet, uh, living alone underground in Amazon pods, eating Amazon goo, working to make the richest people on earth even richer. Or we work together, we take care of each other and the planet, and we share in work that gives our lives meaning and dignity. Um, I have a new project uh, called Planet Hackers. Uh, I need help, it's just getting started. I've realized I can't do this alone, uh, but even better, you should start your own. That's what I wanna say. Okay, uh, I've already gone over what I wanted to. <laughs> uh, in conclusion, this is an awesome conference so far. It's gonna keep being awesome. You're gonna learn a, a whole bunch of new skills while you're watching all these amazing talks but I want you to keep thinking about opportunities for uh, international collaboration and ways to make the world a better place. Uh, as a community, we've done it before. We've been so successful. And I just think that we should uh, keep trying to do it again. Uh, if they need a website, use Zappa, or better yet, don't, uh, don't give any more money to Jeff Bezos, who's an evil Bond villain, and use fashion instead. Uh, whatever you're doing, just keep making awesome stuff. My code is available on my GitHub, my talks, my projects, uh, and thank you. Uh, and again, a huge round of applause for our awesome conference organizers and translation team. Uh, have a great night. Okay. Thank <laughs> 質問がありましたら練習した回答済みのところから見えるかと思いますが、ADHD と自閉スペクトラム障害の当事者ですが、すごく勇気づけられるお話でした。さて、ステートレスを解いていますが、日本では国境を越えて目の前に組織を越えてということ自体がまだまだ
Slack for communication with participants. So I, I copy the questions, the Slack channel. So please, please answer in Slack channel, fellow Slack. Okay. okay. はいえー、とでは、キーノートは以上とします。えー、皆さん、えー、あのあそか、えーと、拍手が遅れる方は Q&A でおかりませんので、最後に拍手をお願いいたします。ありがとうございました。Oh, ご質問は、えー、スラックで、ありがとうございます。Thank you, r i c h i you are g r Um, I'm going to hang out. I'm going to try to make it to the party if I can stay awake.、Uh, but I, I love talking with everybody. So if you want to ask me a question personally, just、uh, reach out. Thank you for listening. <laughs>